Good morning ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Listening Comprehension. Today we're going to be experimenting with the specimen tracks where you practice your listening just right before your listening comprehension exam. And we are dealing with syllabus 1184 which starts from 2023 English language GCEO level. So are you ready? So let's go! Assessment objective for paper 3. What we need to do is to listen to a variety of audio texts and not only do we need to listen to them, we need to show understanding of both literal, inferential, where you have to guess based on the given evidence, and then you have to go to the evaluative level, which is to make a judgment based on the collated information. So this is perhaps not as easy where just listening just for the information, which is on the literal level. So in this case, we are talking about the identification of the main ideas and details which we need as well. So what exactly is it, paper 3? Paper 3 deals with listening communication. Comprehension. And it has two parts. The first section deals with 22 marks. It requires you as a candidate to respond to a variety of listening tasks to assess on a range of listening skills. So it's not just one listening skill per se. And these tasks are actually based on a variety of types of audio text. We have text that recount, which is to explain what actually happened, which describes, explain, inform. This audio text may be accompanied by visuals. In addition, and we are talking about a variety of questions types multiple choice matching filling in the graphic organizers so they may be set as part of your listening comprehension the section B is usually a segment where students struggle they have eight marks there has been an increase of two marks since the 1128 syllabus so they need to listen to an informational text which is not about story but a text that contains a set information perhaps related to expository text and they need to do a simple note-taking exercise which you should be doing way before that so candidates will only listen to the recording only once and that is the part where many candidates actually struggle we will be listening to a number of texts and most importantly you must remember that the entire listening comprehension takes about 45 minutes approximately and that means that the accumulative marks out of section A and B will be 30 marks which will in the end consist of 10% of your overall marks for English language which will be equivalent to two grades different which is quite a lot so we're going to start with section A we will start the recording now part 1 questions 1 to 6 you will hear three different recordings for questions 1 to 6 tick the answer A, B, C or D which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each recording. You will hear each recording twice. Recording one, you will hear part of an interview with a top gymnast. What was your first gymnastics club like? My mom got me to join when I was six. My older sister was already a member and I always felt at home there. I went twice a week initially. I always had plenty of ability don't know more than several other girls there, but I couldn't always follow the coach's instructions at the beginning. Then, as my skills started to develop, when I was about nine, I switched to five times a week. My dad would often take me for extra training before school. I forced myself to really concentrate and practice things over and over again. That's how I came to really stand out and it's when I began to win local club competitions. You were 12 when you took part in your first major championships. What was that experience like? Well, in the lead up, there was hardly any pressure on me. I'd been recovering from an injury which restricted my training. My coach, who was brilliant, told me I'd be up against girls who were stronger and more experienced, but that I shouldn't get stressed about it. She encouraged me to attempt a couple of jumps and a backflip I'd never performed before in public, but also said I should enjoy myself and not worry about mistakes or points, let alone medals. I did what she said, and it was great. You will listen to the recording again. What was your first gymnastics club like? My mum got me to join when I was six. My older sister was already a member and I always felt at home there. I went twice a week initially. I always had plenty of ability, though no more than several other girls there, but I couldn't always follow the coach's instructions at the beginning. Then, 
As my skills started to develop, when I was about nine, I switched to five times a week. My dad would often take me for extra training before school. I forced myself to really concentrate and practice things over and over again. That's how I came to really stand out, and it's when I began to win local club competitions. You were 12 when you took part in your first major championships. What was that experience like? Well, in the lead up, there was hardly any pressure on me. I'd been recovering from an injury, which restricted my training. My coach, who was brilliant, told me I'd be up against girls who were stronger and more experienced, but that I shouldn't get stressed about it. She encouraged me to attempt a couple of jumps and a backflip I'd never performed before in public, but also said I should enjoy myself and not worry about mistakes or points, let alone medals. I did what she said, and it was great. Recording 2 You will hear two friends talking about a vegan restaurant they went to. Will you go back to that vegan restaurant? I doubt if I could afford it very often. I guess you're paying for the decor and location as well as the food. Thinking of it like that, I suppose it wasn't unreasonable. They could have put more thought into how the dishes were presented, though. They weren't very colorful, but I didn't find their appearance off-putting. The soup was nice. And it had an unusual combination of ingredients. There were nuts and fruit, as well as vegetables in there. That was definitely worth trying. The rice and beans dish was a letdown, though. It could have done with some more pepper. I thought hot spices were a common feature of vegan food. Not always. Could you imagine going vegan yourself? It'd be good for the environment if more people did that, and although some friends might think it's a bit weird, that wouldn't bother me. I'd have to eat more lentils, beans and nuts to replace the protein from fish, meat and eggs, but I could manage that. It could be a bit complicated at home if my dad wouldn't want to eat vegan food, but my mum's vegetarian, so I could eat what she does minus the eggs and dairy stuff. Whether I could bear to go without grilled chicken or cheese is another matter. You could always try. You will listen to the recording again. Will you go back to that vegan restaurant? I doubt if I could afford it very often. I guess you're paying for the decor and location as well as the food. Thinking of it like that, I suppose it wasn't unreasonable. They could have put more thought into how the dishes were presented, though. They weren't very colorful, but I didn't find their appearance off-putting. The soup was nice. And it had an unusual combination of ingredients. There were nuts and fruit, as well as vegetables in there. That was definitely worth trying. The rice and beans dish was a letdown, though. It could have done with some more pepper. I thought hot spices were a common feature of vegan food. Not always. Could you imagine going vegan yourself? It'd be good for the environment if more people did that, and although some friends might think it's a bit weird, that wouldn't bother me. I'd have to eat more lentils, beans and nuts to replace the protein from fish, meat and eggs, but I could manage that. It could be a bit complicated at home if my dad wouldn't want to eat vegan food, but my mum's vegetarian, so I could eat what she does minus the eggs and dairy stuff. Whether I could bear to go without grilled chicken or cheese is another matter. You could always try. Recording 3, you will hear a man reviewing a book by an anthropologist called Genevieve von Petzinger. The First Signs by Genevieve von Petzinger is about the geometric signs painted on the walls of 400 caves across Europe. These signs, created between 10 and 40,000 years ago, have been largely ignored, experts have been more interested in the cave paintings of large animals. But von Petzinger surveyed the limited literature on the signs and conducted her own extensive investigations, and created a database of 5,000 symbols, and identified 32 repeated types, including crosses, triangles and zigzags. Von Petzinger concluded that the symbols reflect the emergence of the ability to think in an abstract and creative way, and that this started much earlier than previously thought and happened over more than 30,000 years. These conclusions are what's really significant about her work. 
Now, the book's subtitle is Unlocking the Mysteries of the World's Oldest Symbols. Von Petzinger describes the mysteries at length, but I found myself waiting for them to be unlocked. What do the symbols mean? Are they a simple written language? It eventually became apparent that the mysteries wouldn't be solved, not because von Petzinger isn't a good writer or hasn't studied her subject enough. Far from it. But with the evidence we have, it's simply impossible to unlock all the mysteries. A more accurate subtitle would be gathering the evidence and asking the right questions. That wouldn't be eye-catching, though. Writers often have little control over the covers of their books. And my guess is that von Petzinger would have argued, in vain, for something different because, inside the book, she never oversells her findings, she's very cautious about any conclusions she may draw. For anyone interested in ancient cave art, however, this book is highly recommended. You will listen to the recording again. The First Signs by Genevieve von Petzinger is about the geometric signs painted on the walls of 400 caves across Europe. These signs, created between 10 and 40,000 years ago, have been largely ignored, experts have been more interested in the cave paintings of large animals. But von Petzinger surveyed the limited literature on the signs and conducted her own extensive investigations, and created a database of 5,000 symbols, and identified 32 repeated types, including crosses, triangles and zigzags. Von Petzinger concluded that the symbols reflect the emergence of the ability to think in an abstract and creative way, and that this started much earlier than previously thought and happened over more than 30,000 years. These conclusions are what's really significant about her work. Now, the book's subtitle is Unlocking the Mysteries of the World's Oldest Symbols. Von Petzinger describes the mysteries at length, but I found myself waiting for them to be unlocked. What do the symbols mean? Are they a simple written language? It eventually became apparent that the mysteries wouldn't be solved, not because von Petzinger isn't a good writer or hasn't studied her subject enough. Far from it. But with the evidence we have, it's simply impossible to unlock all the mysteries. A more accurate subtitle would be gathering the evidence and asking the right questions. That wouldn't be eye-catching, though. Writers often have little control over the covers of their books. And my guess is that von Petzinger would have argued, in vain, for something different because, inside the book, she never oversells her findings, she's very cautious about any conclusions she may draw. For anyone interested in ancient cave art, however, this book is highly recommended. This the end of part one. Well, stay tuned for part two. I was always inclined to make history, but I never really had the time. Spent my life living dangerously. Never